Well, when I uh, purposed at the beginning of the year to do a series on beauty and uh, discovered that I would be speaking on Valentine's Day, that seemed to be the obvious day to do something I knew I wanted to do, and that is to speak about the beauty of sexuality. I begin with somebody I've mentioned before, the theologian Jonathan Edwards, who had a passion for the beauty of God, particularly the beauty of the triune God that he saw revealed in nature around him. As a young man, as a new convert, Edwards loved to walk in the woods around his native Hartford, Connecticut, marveling at the beauty, singing God's praise. And maybe you can imagine how fascinated he was to learn about a girl who sounded like a kindred spirit. She lived 50 miles away, about two days' journey by horseback. And in one of his journals, young Edwards wrote down what he had heard about her. They say there is a young lady in New Haven who is beloved of that great being who made and rules the world, and that there are certain seasons in which the great being comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him. She will sometimes go about from place to place singing sweetly. She always seems to be full of joy and pleasure. She loves to be alone, walking in the fields, and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. Needless to say, Edwards made his way to New Haven to meet this remarkable young woman, Miss Sarah Pierpont. Jonathan and Sarah, not surprisingly, fell in love were married, became partners in ministry, raised 11 children together, first captivated by creation to see the beauty of God. They also saw the beauty in one another, and they wanted to share their lives, soul, spirit, and body. Yes, body. The Christian faith is not merely spiritual, but comes to full expression when we honor God with our bodies. And this is evident, one place, in the potential beauty of our sexuality. This marriage between Sarah and Jonathan is one example of the physical, sexual, spiritual union that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where, as has been read for us, the man and the woman hold fast to one another and become one flesh, joined together spiritually and sexually. Sometimes it's easy to get the mistaken impression that when it comes to our sexuality, God is mainly concerned about making sure that we follow his list of do's and don'ts. Certainly, God has told us the one and only context for sexual intimacy, a biblically defined marriage. And he has given us clear commands about avoiding sexual misconduct but he is more concerned about the beauty of the why and about the joy that he knows will come to us when we offer our physical bodies, including our sexual selves, for his glory. The teaching of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 about sex, the body, and the glory of God is so remarkable. Apparently, the Corinthians had been misled into thinking that our spiritual lives belong to another world, and so what we do with our bodies doesn't really matter. Even, for example, they thought having sex with a prostitute is permissible. Paul condemns their promiscuity by saying, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, it is meant for the Lord. And then he goes on to explain that our bodies, not just our souls, are temples for the Holy Spirit. And so what we do with our bodies is deeply spiritual. And Paul concludes with this clear exhortation, glorify God with your body. And so if we ask the question, when is sex beautiful? It is beautiful whenever we honor God with our bodies. And this happens most obviously, perhaps, when a husband and wife share sexual intimacy. Notice I use the verb share 
People more commonly talk about having sex, which sounds like something, a verb that you would use when you're emphasizing what you can get for yourself. Wouldn't it make more sense to talk about sharing sex or giving sex? Marital intercourse is beautiful when it is self-giving instead of self-loving. And sex becomes beautiful when couples share their lives, not just their bedroom. In her remarkable book, A Personal Narrative, Sex and the City of God, Carolyn Weber wisely observes that when we enter another body, we enter another life. We enter another's joys and sorrows, needs and wants, and only the marriage promises of self-giving love can bear the weight of that commitment. Sex is Beautiful, too, if I'm asking the question, when is it beautiful? It's beautiful when it's fruitful. That's another time, as God originally intended, producing the gift of children also made in the image of God. And I could say more about all of those subjects, but what I want to say now is that married sex is especially beautiful when it tells the gospel story. And here we encounter an extraordinary mystery, essential not just to understanding the why of sexuality in God's design, but really the entire plan of redemption. This relationship between husband and wife, including their one flesh union, is intended to illustrate our saving love relationship with Jesus Christ. And we know this because when Paul quotes from Genesis 2, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, the two will become one flesh. He, he adds this comment, this mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And if you have any doubt about that connection between the human and the earthly and the divine and the spiritual, all you need to do is turn to the last few pages of the Bible where Jesus is the worthy groom the church is his purified bride, and they live happily ever after. Sex is beautiful when it tells that story, the gospel story. Married sexual intimacy is a mystery because it lifts us beyond what is merely physical to signal something transcendent. And to understand that, it helps to remember that our bodies are made in the very image of God. They always carry spiritual meaning. I love the way that Christopher West explains this. He says, the body is not only biological, but since we were made in the image of God, male and female, the body is also theologically, theological. And it tells an astounding divine story precisely through the mystery of sexual differences and the call of the two to become one flesh. When we get this right, our lives bear witness to the passionate love of our Savior Jesus Christ, and our hearts are married to Christ's heart. Now, a couple of times I have come close to saying sex is beautiful, but on a number of occasions I've added a qualifier, sex can be beautiful, it is possible that. And that is because, like everything else in this fallen world, sexuality is damaged and distorted. And for almost everyone in this room, some of us more painfully than others, that is not merely theoretical, it is experiential. And so in speaking about sex, we need to ask why our sexual experience exposes so much ugliness. Why is it that we go off script from the gospel story in which even sex is for the glory of God and tell our own story instead? And the simple answer is that too often people want the pleasures of sin more than they want the beauty of God. There are many ways of talking about sexual sin and the damage it does to us and to others. Sexual sin is a rejection of biblical truth. It's a transgression of God's law. We could talk about all of those things, but sexual sin, I believe, is also ugly. And that is reason enough to choose a different path. It's ugly when it betrays a trust, when it breaks a promise. Any and every form of sexual abuse is ugly, rape, 
sex trafficking, incest, domestic violence, and so on, the physical harm and personal exploitation of another human being, usually, though not always a woman, could never be anything except an ugly violation of the beautiful image of God. Pornography is ugly, too, because it portrays visual images of the human body, which is inherently beautiful. Sexual imagery may tempt us into thinking we're looking at something beautiful, but we are deceived. As an industry of exploitation, pornography teaches viewers to see other people merely as objects of selfish desire. And so the late Christian philosopher Roger Scruton in his little introduction to beauty describes pornography as a desecration of human beauty that damages both present self and future other. In other words, immediately it harms the viewer, but eventually it hurts other people too because the way it teaches you to view other people and treat other people, not the people on the screen only, but the, the real people that you have to live with every day, it is selfish and therefore ugly. What about masturbation? Much could be said about this subject too, about self-stimulation as self-worship, something that wastes away our spiritual and sexual powers. But let me just ask this question, is it beautiful? And the answer, I think, is no, because it is about having and taking, not giving and sharing. And notice something about, I think, every form of sexual transgression, it fails to express enduring love. And so rather than cherishing another person, it uses another person. Only loving actions are truly beautiful, the things we do for others and not just for ourselves. And so when we are taking sex or keeping sex or using sex or stealing sex, we are not giving or sharing it in the beautiful way that God intends. I think that insight is helpful because it gives us, maybe for many of us, something new to say when we are tempted to sin in sexual ways. We can always say, this is wrong, we shouldn't do this, but we can also say something like this, this isn't beautiful the way that Jesus wants it to be. And I want my life, I want your life, I want our lives to be more beautiful. Knowing when sex gets ugly also gives us another way to pray when we stumble and fall into sin, as we all do. First, we repent, not waiting even one more minute to ask God to forgive our sins for Jesus' sake. By the power of the cross and the empty tomb, no sin, no sexual sin is too great for God's grace. And then we ask God to help us go and sin no more. Lord, by your gracious spirit, make me strong to stand against Satan and make my life by your beautiful spirit more beautiful, sexually beautiful for you. And the Holy Spirit won't wait another minute either. He will start making us stronger and holier and more beautiful right away when we offer such a prayer. But now at this point, I, I want to expand on what I mean when I say that sex is beautiful or that it can be. So far, I've been talking primarily or exclusively about sexual relationships between a husband and wife, that beautiful thing, a husband and wife bound together by covenant promise. But that is not the only way, and it may not even be the most important way that our sexuality can be beautiful for God. There's another form of sexual beauty that is more common that can be expressed by anyone, regardless of marital status or sex or age or sexual orientation. I refer to the beauty of chastity, the sacrificial beauty of refraining from sex outside the bonds of covenant promise. 
Such purity, admittedly, seems contrary to natural inclination. At the end of her best-selling book, Sex in History, Rhea Tannehill writes, the truth is that there has never been a very close match between human instincts and Christian sexual morality. She's right about that, isn't she? What we want for us and what God wants for us can often feel like a contradiction. Pursuing sexual purity is a hard struggle. Many of us, I think, can relate to what Mother Teresa said when she was asked if it was hard to keep her vow of chastity. Yes, she said, I find it sometimes very difficult to smile at my spouse, Jesus, because he can be very demanding sometimes. But know this, the demand for sexual purity is the clear teaching of scripture, and therefore it must be God's will for our lives. Listen how clearly, how directly Paul says this in his first letter to the Thessalonians chapter four. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like those who don't know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother or sister in this matter. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And I find that last little phrase transforming not only this passage, but really life itself, because this is the place where God promises us his spirit. The gift of God's beautiful Holy Spirit means that we do have the power to resist temptation, including sexual temptation, that we can live in a way that is holy for God. And here is something I believe every Christian should know, that we unleash extraordinary spiritual power and witness stunning beauty when we offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. Remember, God made us in his image. Remember, too, you were bought with a price which Jesus paid in blood to wash away your sin. And therefore, your body is not your own. Even though our culture tells us that we have a right to do what we want, when we want, with whom we want. The truth is that our bodies belong to God, both by creation and by redemption, and therefore are not our personal property, but our stewardship responsibility. And if it seems as if giving your body to God is a sacrifice, that's because it is. And in this area of sexuality, a sexual sacrifice. It's, it's also a gift. It's a gift to God, and it's a gift to anyone who is honored and protected by the holy choices that you make with your body. And like most willing sacrifices, this freely offered gift is beautiful. One of the most remarkable testimonies of the beauty of sexual sacrifice comes from Helen Rosevere. She spoke in chapel here many years ago to great effect. She's the kind of person I look at her life, I say the world is not worthy. Mm. Rosevere was an English medical missionary to Congo. Her life and sufferings bore global witness to the evangelical church. When she first came to Christ, she was a college student at the time. She was at Cambridge University. She went on an, out on a nearby hillside and pledged her life for kingdom service. And this is what she prayed. Okay, God, today I mean it. Go ahead and make me more like Jesus, whatever the cost. And whenever, please, when I feel I can't stand anymore and cry out, stop, will you ignore my stop? And remember that today I said, go ahead. Rosevere would later testify to the way her prayers were answered. In a time of civil war, Congolese terrorists overran her hospital they did many terrible things that day, including raping Helen Rosevere. And in those terrible moments, she recognized, and she writes about this, 
that she was suffering with Christ and for Christ. But after suffering that ugly abuse, she faced an unexpected temptation. I don't suppose anyone has ever read something like this in any missionary newsletter except what Helen Rosevear said. She admitted with stunning transparency that she experienced sexual desire more strongly after that experience than in any other time in her life as a single woman. And this meant for her that she had to surrender again her sexuality, body and soul back to Jesus so that she could keep on living the beautiful life that she knew God was calling her to live. And this may be the most important thing I say today. Sex is not just beautiful when it is shared in marriage, but any time it is surrendered to Jesus, any time that this is done. And this is something, wonderfully, that anyone can do at any moment in life. It means that both marriage and singleness are equally high callings, different complementary ways to live into the beauty of a faithful sacrificial life that brings glory to God, different ways to use our bodies to tell the story of God's faithfulness to us in Jesus Christ. Now, all of that may seem very costly, particularly when you hear a story like Helen Roosevelt's story. And so you might be tempted to ask, is it worth it? Is it worth the struggle to turn away from the pleasures of sin? I think the best answer to that question was spoken in the upper room, where Jesus shared one last supper with his disciples before he was tried and tortured and crucified on the cross of Calvary. Do you remember clearly what Jesus said that night? He took a piece of bread and he said to his disciples, as he says to us, this is my body given for you. And when you hear those words, you remember the beautiful sacrifice of love that saved the world. And maybe you remember too the infinite cost of that sacrifice demanded Jesus to live a perfectly sinless life. He too was tempted to sexual sin, tempted in his case as a single man. We don't know when or with whom, but we know that Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are. That's what Hebrews says. Surely that had to include sexual temptation, which he resisted. And so before he died a sacrificial death for us, Jesus lived a sacrificial life for us, a beautiful life. And now he invites you to live a beautiful life for him from this moment forward and every time you fall. He does more than invite by his spirit, he empowers. It was specifically to sexual sinners to those who were misused and misusing that the apostle Paul wrote, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of God. And when we live into the cleansing, sanctifying, justifying power of Jesus Christ, then our lives and even our bodies tell a gospel story. We're going to close this morning by singing part of that gospel story in Christ alone. Let's stand while the chapel band is coming forward.
love of God your Father, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit empower you for your joy and for his glory to live the beautiful life he is calling you to live. Amen.